Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunayevskaya. Uh, this is the introduction. This is a quote from Karl Marx. Freedom is so much the essence of man that even its opponents realize it. No man fights freedom. He fights at most the freedom of others. Every kind of freedom has therefore always existed, only at one time as a special privilege, another time as a universal right. Um, this is a quote by Hegel. When individuals and nations have once got in their heads the abstract concept of full-blown liberty, there is nothing like it in its uncontrollable strength, just because it is the very essence of mind and that as its very actuality. If to be aware of the idea, to be aware, i.e., that men are aware of freedom as their essence, aim, and object is a matter of speculation. Still, this very idea itself is the actuality of men, not something which they have as men, but which they are. Uh, introduction. Today, in the face of the constant struggle of man for full freedom on both sides of the Iron Curtain, there is a veritable conspiracy to identify Marxism a theory of liberation with its opposite, communism, the theory and practice of enslavement. This book aims to reestablish Marxism in its original form, which Marx called a thoroughgoing naturalism or humanism. Hitherto, the American roots of Marxism have remained hidden. It is known, although not widely, that Marx aided the North during the Civil War in the United States. Less well known is the fact that the paths of the abolitionists and Marx crossed at that time. What is not known at all is that under the impact of the Civil War and the subsequent struggles for the eight-hour day, Marx completely reorganized the structure of his greatest theoretical work, Capital. This is analyzed here for the first time. Our epoch has been characterized by a struggle for the minds of men, unless the struggle begins with a concept of total new relations of men to labor and man to man. It is hollow. The todayness of Marxism flows from this. No philosopher has ever had a grander concept of humanity than did Marx, and yet no philosophic concept was ever rooted more deeply in the first necessity of human society, labor and production. The fact that the H-bomb has put a question mark over the very survival of civilization does not change this. The answer to that problem is not in today's headlines. It is in production. That is what makes Marx so contemporary. The problems he posed 100 years ago are battled out today as concrete matters in the factory and in society as a whole. Until the development of the totalitarian state, the philosophic foundation of Marxism was not fully understood. Only today is it possible to comprehend that Marx's rejection of the communism of his day was not a 19th century humanitarian adjunct to his scientific economic theories. Far from being a vulgar materialist, Marx based his perspectives of the inevitable collapse of capitalism and the rise of a new human order on a realization that workers would seek universality and completeness in their actual social lives as producers. Because communism was a mere rejection of private property. Communism to Marx was not the goal of human development, the form of human society. Marxism is a theory of liberation, or it is nothing. Whereas Marx was concerned with the freedom of humanity and with the inevitable waste of human life, which is the absolute general law of capitalist development, Russian communism rests on the mainspring of capitalism, paying the worker the minimum and extracting from him the maximum. They dubbed this the plan. Marx called it the law of value and surplus value. He predicted that its unhindered or unhindered development would lead to the concentration of capital in the hands of a single capitalist or a single capitalist corporation. Marx foresaw the present trend toward state capitalism not because he was a prophet, but because of his dialectical method of tracing through to the end all trends of social development. It is impossible to understand Marx's major theoretical works if one begins by thinking that the particular method, Hegelian dialectics, is an absurdity. 
The absurdity would be if the method were the proof. The proof can only be in practice, in the actual development of society itself. This book, therefore, covers the modern machine age from its birth in the Industrial Revolution to its present-day development in automation. Three leading strands of thought are developed here. One, the evolution of English political economy, French revolutionary doctrines, and German idealist Hegelian philosophy in relation to the actual social development of the period of 1776 to 1831. Two, the development of Marxism and Marx's day and since in relation to the actual class struggles in the epoch of the Civil War in the United States in the Paris Commune, as well as World War I in the Russian Revolution. Three, the methodology of Marxism applied to the problems that arise from the trend towards state capitalism on the one hand and a movement for total freedom on the other. The unity of theory and practice, which characterized the 40 years of Marx's maturity, 1843 to 1883, is the compelling need of our own epoch as well. The impulse for writing this book came from two sources. One, the American workers, and two, the East German workers. It was the period of 1950 to 1953, the period of the Korean War and of Stalin's death. During those years, the American workers, specifically the miners and auto workers, began to come to grips with the realities of automation by moving the question of productivity from one dealing with the fruits of labor, wages, to one dealing with the conditions of labor and the need for a totally new way of life. It was the period when the East German workers challenged the communist regime in their revolt of June 17, 1953. A revolt in the slave labor camps of Vorkuta inside Russia itself followed within a few weeks. Thus, in the wilds of Siberia, as well as in the heart of Europe, the toxin has sounded for the beginning of the end of Russian to totalitarianism. From the philosopher in the ivory tower to the man on the street, the world is preoccupied with this question. Can man be free in this age of totalitarianism? We leaped generations ahead to the affirmative answer with the 1953 re revolts and again with the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. The road to a new society was no less illuminated or illumined by the Negro struggles of 1956 to 57. At the same time, the little war over Suez brought us close to the brink of World War III. Nevertheless, out of the totality of the world crisis, these emerged their there emerged a search for a new philosophy on both sides of the Atlantic. No theoretician today, more than ever before, can write out of his own head. Theory requires a constant shaping and reshaping of ideas on the basis of what the workers themselves are doing and thinking. The research for this book, for example, on the transformation of Russia from a worker's state into its opposite, a state capitalist society, began at the outbreak of World War II. Scholars, some who did and some who did not, agree with my conclusions, took part. In its beginning, this work was a Marxist analysis of state capitalism, but it did not take its present form of Marxism and freedom until the new stage of production and of revolts was reached in 1950-53. to 53. Because we live in an age of absolutes, on the threshold of absolute freedom out of the struggle against absolute tyranny, the compelling need for a new unity of theory and practice dictates a new method of writing. At least, it dictated the method by which this book was written. A tour was undertaken to present orally the ideas of the book to groups of auto workers, miners, steel workers, and student youth. In their own words and out of their own lives, they contributed a new understanding. A West Virginia mar miner, for example, modest about his own understanding of Marxism, took freedom out of its abstraction and gave it concrete meaning. I've listened to you discussing that fellow Marx, he said. I can't word it like him, but I know exactly what he means. I lay there this morning about a quarter of six. I looked out the window. I said to myself, you just got to get up there and go down, whether you feel like it or not. I didn't even speak it to my wife. I just said to myself, now you call that a free man? After these discussions, the first draft of the book was written. 
The manuscript was then submitted to some of these groups for study, and over a period of three months, their discussions were taped. Again, the author studied the discussions carefully, revised the first draft, draft, and undertook a second tour for extensive personal discussions, some of which are reproduced in the text. Only after these extensive discussions was the book in its present form finally written. This work is therefore dedicated to the auto workers, miners, steel workers, and student youth who have participated so fully in the writing of this book. They are its co-authors.